Welcome to this Jungian life. Three good friends and Jungian analysts, Lisa Marciano, Deborah Stewart, and Joseph Lee, invite you to join them for an intimate and honest conversation that brings a psychological perspective to important issues of the day. I'm Lisa Marciano, and I'm a Jungian analyst in Philadelphia. I'm Joseph Lee, and I'm a Jungian analyst in Virginia Beach, Virginia. I'm Deborah Stewart, a Jungian analyst on Cape Cod. Hello, everyone. Today, we decided we would go back to some core ideas that are psychoanalytic and also inform Jungian work. Today, we're going to talk about projective identification. Now, some of you may think that that's maybe an obscure clinical term, but as we unpack it, I think you'll come to appreciate that it is something that is much more common than we realize. Sometimes we generate this kind of behavior. Sometimes we are subject to it. By understanding how this works, we can become more skillful at navigating this kind of Mm. provocative defense. Melanie Klein is the one who noticed this based on infant observations. And in a nutshell, what she observed is that infants will actually project certain material into the mother Uh as a way of trying to contain the intensity of their own growing psychological life. And mothers will often report feeling sweeps of intense primal feelings. Uh As we grow, sometimes as adults, we will fall down into that primal level of consciousness and we'll find ourselves as adults doing a similar thing, projecting a feeling into someone else and then subtly provoking that person Mm -hmm. to demonstrate the feeling. So that's what we're going to jump into today. Great. And before we do, I want to take a minute and invite you all to like us, follow us, subscribe, follow our social media channels. We've got a lot of uh, content there. And we have a mailing list. You can join our mailing list. We send out an email newsletter once a month with some cool content. So if you just can't get enough of us, that's another way. And also, just to remind you about Dream School, if you like what we do with Dreams on the podcast, Dream School is our 12-month self-paced online program where we teach you how to work with your dreams. And uh, you can also become a patron. You can go to the website, thisunionlife.com, click on podcast, and you'll see the drop down for become our patron on Patreon, where we produce extra content. We're adding some exciting new things to Patreon. So it's a good time to come aboard. And finally, I also want to mention that I have a women's retreat coming up. It's a fairy tale and yoga retreat in central Pennsylvania from April 25th through 28th. It is always a lot of fun. So um, come hang out with me and uh, we'll talk about fairy tales. And um, you can see how um, very pathetic my downward dog is. And uh, we'll eat good food, and (laughs) hang out in the beautiful springtime in central Pennsylvania. So, That sounds like that's going to be an exciting, fun time, Lisa. Yeah. It always is. I think uh, what what I'm aware of here is that on many levels and in many ways, um, we've started out today talking about community. And uh, there can be an in-person experience at Lisa's Women's Retreat, and you can join our Jungian Life community in a lot of different ways. And find all find out about all uh, about our Dream School, by the way, at our website, thisunionlife.com. So that's the hub. Come find yeah. us. If you want to know more about my <laughs> Women's right. Retreat, you can go to my website, lisamarciano.com. Yeah. 
And with Dream School, we have in-person meetings. Each of us holds one once a month. So um, there really is a community and uh, possibilities for interacting with yourself, with us, with other people. Come on in. So and with jumping that, back let's... into projective identification. Right. But what, where I went after your introduction, Joseph, is uh, what it is essentially is communication. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think everybody has had experiences of, of nonverbal communication. Mothers and babies, certainly, every mother has had that experience. A and we also, people talk all the time about oh, I just had a sense that so-and-so uh, wanted this or somebody needed something or whatever it is. And for Jung, uh, Jung posited communication at the unconscious to unconscious level. Uh, so projective identification is, uh, has a, a real interactional uh, component of I want you, whoever the you is, to feel something, to do something, to empathize with me, to pick up my feelings, to carry something for me. Um, but the reality of unconscious to unconscious communication, I think, is quite well established in everyone's experience and in many a theory. So why don't we, why don't we start by trying to define projective identification? Because I don't think we've really done that yet. So, Deb, what do you got? Uh, well, it is part where I start is with the idea that it's part of a theory of early, early development called object relations. And it's one component of that where how our interaction with others is internalized. So uh, what, do, what does a baby, for example, make of having to wait for mom? Baby wakes up, the baby's hungry. And mom takes five minutes to get there, or even is there right away. Of that baby has its own internal experience of what that weight is like. Uh, it's not a big deal, or it is a big deal. Uh, the baby has feelings of frustration, let's say. So we make of experience something of our own. And then we communicate that to, in this case, the mother. Uh, and it's unconscious to unconscious communication. But we have a way, of course, from early, early on, of getting our feelings across to another person. And that exerts a pull on the other person. So it may exert the pull on the mother to realize that this baby, when he wakes up, is uh, incredibly hungry right away, and she needs to really uh, be right there immediately. So the baby has affected the mother with his representation of emotional experience that then gets communicated back to the mother and uh, influences the mother's behavior. I, I'm going to try uh, something here from Thomas Ogden, which uh, Nancy McWilliams quotes. So this is a, a little pithier, maybe, but it's a hard concept to understand. So I, th I think it's important that we set this up at the, at the outset. Mm -hmm. So Ogden writes, in projective identification... Not only does the patient view the therapist in a distorted way that is determined by the patient's past object relations, in addition, mm -hmm. pressure is exerted on the therapist to experience himself in a way that is congruent with a patient's unconscious fantasy. So let me try translating that into English. Exactly. We're talking about <laughs> projection. <laughs> We're talking about what we project on someone else. So, you know, that's a fairly familiar term to us. If, if we felt abandoned by our parents, we might project onto our partner that he's going to abandon us. Uh, but the, the, the next part of it, the, uh, the identification, 
is that the person who is receiving the projection feels an unconscious pull to behave in the way that matches the projection. So that's as sharp as I can get it, I think. Yes. Yeah. And that is a parallel with very, very early experience. It spirals up and becomes more sophisticated, but we learn the, we have emotional experiences from day one, uh, and uh, they become templates for interaction. So to use your example, Lisa, if if a child felt abandoned or left alone too much, uh, then when that person's partner is uh, 15 minutes late, it may uh, generate feelings of, oh my God, you know, he doesn't care about me. I feel um, abandoned. I feel dismissed, not cared about, etc. And when that person gets there, he or she may be induced to feel a particular guilt or remorse or regret in order to be in alignment with the projection of abandonment. It well, is a convoluted he, concept. But he also might be induced not to feel remorse, but to feel like annoyance, like he wants to get away from the person. So that, you, Ex- you know, it, it has exactly. a self-fulfilling uh, prophecy quality to it, where you induce the other person to do the thing that you are worried that they'll do. I mean, I remember when I first learned about projective identification in graduate school, I was like, oh, like suddenly all these things <laughs> made sense. It was like, yeah, you know, I, I've done that. And I've been on the other end of that. Like, oh, that's really interesting, right? Like it, it we, we, we can make others behave in the way that we are afraid they will behave. And as as analysts, we see Mm -hmm. this again and again and again. Yeah. And and sometimes people feel and say, you know, I really feel manipulated by, by him or her. But what's important to know about projective identification is that it is unconscious. It's not it's not a conscious decision to you know, I'm going to get him to invite me out to dinner. Um, it, it is automatic and it comes straight from the unconscious. And the difference between projection and projective identification is that projection can happen without any interpersonal mm-hmm. relationship. So therefore you can project things onto movie stars, onto your neighbor, onto somebody mm-hmm. that you just caught a glimpse of in the store. And the experience stays really inside of you. In that way, Jung would say the psyche is trying to get you to be aware of something through the act of projection. Projective identification, as we were just saying, can really only happen in a relationship that we are pulling somebody into what we would call an enactment. Now, the early analysts generally assumed that the enactment had something to do with early childhood dynamics between the child and the primary caregiver. So there's different theories as to why that happens. One very basic idea is that we are comforted by re-experiencing our early childhood dynamics, even if they were fraught, because it still was an attachment. So we will sometimes be attracted to people who mistreat us, perhaps in the way that our parents mistreated us, because it is something that's familiar, and there is a safety in what is known. Yeah, that's very well put, Joseph. Yeah. Now, when adults are still doing that in their lives, It may be that they do it infrequently when they're put under massive amounts of stress. And this is true for any of us. If you've ever been in a car accident, you know, and the the next few hours afterwards you find yourself saying things or doing things that just were highly unusual. But that's often because we've been cast backwards in time because of the stress. 
there may be other circumstances where we we behave in ways that are, are not familiar to ourselves. But when we become very, very young, one of the things that we are reaching for is a state of oceanic union mm-hmm. with another person, which sometimes is called an ouroboric relationship with someone. The Freudian said this was a pre oedipal stage. It's very, very early. And so the psyche wants the safety and connection of that oceanic merging with another person. And in that way, the traits of the distressed person comes distributed in mm-hmm. the oceanic field. So there is no clear sense of where I am and where you are. And of course, this is probably the experience that a child has, an infant has. One of the hypotheses about that very early experience of the infant um, and the infant's lack of ability to really, of course, there's no ego yet, so there's no sense of, um, oh, I'm here and you're there and we're two separate people. So uh, one of the early object relations theorists uh, who really lifted up projective identification into the psychological uh, vocabulary was Melanie Klein, uh, a British uh, analyst who's Austrian and moved to England and worked there. And she theorized that that a baby's first uh, orientation is what she called the paranoid schizoid position. Uh, which uh, you know sounds pretty f- sort of formal and uh, strange, but that what the infant could do uh, w- was simply to have two separate uh, feeling level categories of what is good and what is bad, and it got um, you know sort of shortened into the good breast and the bad breast. So when the baby is hungry and mom appears. Uh, to feed, that is good. Uh, when mom does not appear or the baby is uncomfortable in some way, that is bad. A- and that those two things are very, uh, very, very separate uh, realities for the baby. This stage is succeeded, she thought, in uh, the latter part of the baby's first year of life by what she called the depressive position, which is the dawning realization uh, that mom is one and the same person all the time. But sometimes I am gratified and sometimes I am not. And that there's a stage of kind of mourning for that previous stage of the good mother that gratifies me, whatever I want and whatever I need, comes from the outside, from some good source. And then there is um, something separate uh, that is distressing or bad. Uh, No, there's an other person here. And we have good, yeah. From that oceanic blending. Yes. Eventually into, oh, there's a me and there's a you. Yeah. And so it finally becomes a, a dyad yeah. goes from the unus mundus mm-hmm. into yeah. the ego and other state, yeah. which is developmentally normal. Yes. I'm smiling because of what you just said, of there's a you. And part of us, I think, for our whole lives goes, no, oh, damn, you know, you don't always match up with exactly what I want. Uh, there is no you who is perfect. We're going to be disappointed. And loving and receive love, and you know, all of the other uh, shades of interaction that go along with human beings. Now, this expectation in the Unus Mundus and the blended state is something that is ubiquitous on social media. I mean, if you go on TikTok or Instagram, you're going to see just hosts of. <laughs> Of, of TikTok stars that will talk about having a date. She had a date with a guy, and that if he doesn't meet her needs, he is out. He is just worth nothing. 
that he better, <laughs> you know, treat me like a, a queen, which is also saying treat me like a baby, where any need that I have, this person is going to instantly meet. And if this person doesn't make me instantly happy, they are out the door. And that's part of that splitting. Either my frustrations and needs are going to be met, or the person is is bad in some fashion. And I'm not going to be okay until I get somebody who is always mm-hmm. going to be the good breast for gratifying, me. Gratifying, right? The other yeah. person should be gratifying. At all times. And that's the, <laughs> that's the thing is there's no tolerance for yeah. a frustration in the relationship. And when we're around any adult who, who can't tolerate a reasonable amount of frustration, we know that they're in that very early mm. place and they're looking for the comfort of a merged relationship. And, and so projective identification is considered to be, a, you know, a fairly primitive defense in the language of, of psychoanalysis. So, you know, it's kind of classically thought of as sort of a borderline defense, uh, you know, a not very advanced defense, like, for example, intellectualization is a much uh, more uh, sophisticated defense. But I would say that... Uh, I don't know. I think that we probably all engage in projective identification a lot of the time. So I, I'm not. I'm not really with the program that this is only something that happens if you're not a well-established, uh, you know, psychologically refined person. You know, we we can all we can all do this, and it actually brings to mind something that you were just saying, Joseph, about uh, you know people on social media. Edinger, Edward Edinger, a Jungian analyst, has this uh, this wonderful thing that he says that I, I I just think it's so brilliant, and I'm only I'm only paraphrasing it, but he says something like we only look to get from others what we do not give ourselves, and I think that mm-hmm. this is really in the spirit of projective identification, right? So if you are very anxious, for example about, uh, let's say, let's say you're a young person about to graduate from college and you're very, very anxious about your career and you haven't really gotten your feet up under you. You haven't maybe taken advantage of some of the things that you might have taken advantage of. You don't know what you want to do. You feel lost. You feel scared. You know, one of the things you could do in that situation is say, right, well, I'd better figure my stuff out. Let me go to the career center. (laughs) Let me take stock of my strengths and weaknesses. Let me come up with a plan. But if you're feeling rather more dysregulated than that, you might engage in projective identification. You know, for example, you might lash out, you know, at someone and, and, and what you want to do in that sense is you're really trying to induce in the other person, the distress that you're feeling. So, and, and that's where, that's where it goes back to like, this is one of you said earlier, projective identification is really just communication. So, you know, you don't have the ability to, to really, um, say, well, gosh, I am feeling really terrified and, uh, you know, I, I, I need to really take that on board and maybe I can ask for empathy. It's like too much. It's too overwhelming. So instead you revert to, let me see if I can make you feel as distressed as I feel. And, and so you might lash out at your parents, for example, and why didn't you send me to a different college? Or, you know, why, why can't you buy me an apartment or something like that? Uh, you know, sort of really, really kind of itching for a fight. I mean, it might, it might be something completely absurd, like, you know, don't you realize, you know, how, how, uh, you know, how how expensive living the cost of living is you know and so you're you're kind of lashing out at someone really trying to unconsciously the aim is let let me let me induce you into uh um having this this big reaction so it's like an invitation to dance right right and, and let me uh induce you into feeling like i feel yeah 
uh, now, now we both feel that way. And uh, just as you said before, Joseph, I mean, I think part of it is like we have, you know, the reaction is like, oh, my God, um, let me fix it. And the other reaction is, you know, this person is being a pain in the tail and we're going to have a fight. And I, I think um, uh, people who are partners in life, you know, uh, married couples, for example, you know, often get into this. Oh, yes. All the time. Oh, yes. <laughs> All the time. You know, let me, let me just go back to my yeah. example for one minute because I want to, I want to, I didn't get it quite right and I really want to peg it okay. in. So the, in this case, right, the young person is making the parents feel, you know, his distress, this, right? So there's that level of communication. But the young person also wants to blame the parents for what is wrong in his life. And so ah. if he can pick a fight with his ah. parents and get them to react as, you know, eventually, if you've got mm -hmm. uh, a screaming kid blaming you for their everything is wrong, you're going to be like, wait a minute, <laughs> you know, this is your responsibility and you need to, right? And then you've become the thing that your kid, uh, it's like your kid has put you in that role. You're this, yes. you're this parent I who's. Yes. Who's to blame for everything wrong in my life. And then eventually, if, you know, if there's enough and, and the person, you know, the parent can't like kind of white knuckle it, the parent becomes the bad, oppressive, withholding parent right. that the kid is trying exactly. to turn them into. And then what's happened in that little, in that little dynamic is that young person does not have to take responsibility for his life. Because he's created a story where yeah. it's it's all his parents' fault, and now they've acted that out. Yeah, <laughs> it's really That's devilish. A, it's a great strategy, isn't it? Uh, you know, if the parent is, if the parent or the spouse, you know, it, it, that you is to blame for how I feel. And there's a, a negative, defensive, angry reaction. See, you proved my point. Because um, here you are being difficult right. and refusing right. to understand me. And, and the parent was refusing to take responsibility. Uh, right. See, I'm right. It is your fault. <laughs> and one of the clues it's... that we can see with, with projective identification is those relational dynamics will show up in many different places. Yeah. Uh -huh. You know, if we've lived long enough, like every, I seem to get fired after two years and the same mm -hmm. complaints come my way or my uh -huh. relationships only last six months. And I'm always feeling this way over and over again. And so we're often not terribly creative in this unconscious way. There's a very specific mm -hmm. content that's very hard for us to hold on to. So we have a tendency to slip that same content over to the other person. So let's say that anger, for whatever reason, was very dangerous for a child to hold when they're young. Maybe their parents were brutally um, savage towards the child if they evidence any anger. So the anger really falls out of memory. And when that person winds up feeling comfortable or in the a relationship sooner or later, that anger is going to get inserted into the people around, and then it'll get pulled forward, yanked forward. This happens with passive aggressive personality types. The passive aggressive person often has no sense of their own anger about something, and so they'll behave in ways that induce anger in other people. Mm -hmm. and then distance themselves because the other person is so unpleasant and they feel that they're being you know, mistreated in some way. So, of course, the healing comes from recognizing what it is that we are disowning mm -hmm. and to actually have conscious experience of the thing that we keep inducing in other people. And, and Joseph, I'm thinking based on what you just said, you know, we talked about how it's a communication. Yes. But I think it's also a way of managing feelings that feel too big and overwhelming. 
So you were talking about anger. It's like mm-hmm. like putting it in someone else and having them become angry. That's like that's like a way of like okay, well I dealt with my anger. You're doing it for me. Or in in the little made up vignette that mm-hmm. I shared, it's like I feel too scared about my future and instead of dealing with that, I want to I want to externalize it, make it someone else's fault. And and so so it it is a way of a, you know kind of like a listening empathy in a, in a way or connection, uh, but but it also is a way of uh, of not feeling our feelings, of like sort of having someone else do mm-hmm. it for us. Right. So I think that there's um, the example you gave of the parent child dynamic is complicated. Because I can imagine several different dynamics happening there, some of which are developmental, uh, some of which may have to do with an intense sense of stress. Um, mm-hmm. So I'm still wondering sure. how I imagine what is the intolerable emotion that the child is experiencing that they're pushing into the other person. And I'm wondering if it's powerlessness. Yeah, yeah, that yeah. The yeah, child that feels, feels, that feels powerless. Right. And, and then the parents have the sense uh-huh. that they're powerless. Like nothing I say works. Every bit of advice mm-hmm. is rejected. I have. I, I, there's nothing I can do to help help my son finally, you know, get launched. And so the parents, how they um, experience the helplessness, can sound different topically from uh, mm-hmm. the young person. But but it the underlying strata. There's a there's a similarity of feeling. That's being mm-hmm. pushed around. I, that's my understanding of it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. The idea of being provocative can have a lot of other uh, developmental uh, experiments that are happening in mm-hmm. young people in yeah. terms of being learning how to be powerful and dominating and trying out new strategies of getting your needs met. Uh, I, I think the flip side of the powerlessness uh, is rage. You know, little infants can be just rageful. Uh, it's not conscious enough to be angry of, you know, I wanted that cookie and you won't give it to me, so I'm mad. It is much more primal and much more basic. And that rage and powerlessness are often heads and tails of the same coin. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, to go back to your example, Lisa, of you know, many, many, uh, a college senior or high school senior, like, uh, I have to get out into the big wide world and I don't know if I can do it. And I feel powerless and, and, and I feel rageful. I feel that sense of primal frustration and need and my need isn't being met. And uh, if I can put part of it into, uh, a, a parent or someone else, I have, I've been able to locate it elsewhere. It's not in me anymore. But it's difference... not a real solution, but it's uh, emotionally, obviously, it works at least temporarily. But if it was working, then the child would suddenly become calm. And if the parent and the child <laughs> are still raging at each other, then it wasn't yeah. rage that was passed over. So sometimes, and we've all had experience having a friend or acquaintance, you know, induce anger in us. And if we express the anger, the other person becomes very, very peaceful and very calm (laughs) and will often then accuse us of being a chronically angry person. And maybe they need, you know, we need some help, you know, getting, getting over that. Maybe need to go to therapy, (laughs) something (laughs) like that. Yes. So when it's all out in the front, when both you know the parents and the kids have their AK-47s firing at each other, it doesn't seem like the anger is an aggression is the thing that's being suppressed. So I'm going to toss out another uh, example. No, it's not being suppressed. It's being expressed. Yeah. Okay, yeah. go for it. Okay. So here, here's my other example that maybe we can talk about is... Um, 
So let's say that you are uh, with someone that you worry doesn't like you very much, and they've kind of made it clear that they don't like you, and you uh, have to spend <laughs> time. Have to spend time. Oh, I don't know. Let's say you're both assigned to kitchen duty for uh, your book club, and I'm just totally making this up. So, so there you are in the kitchen together. You guys have to make the coffee and put the cookies out or whatever. And you feel a little bit on the back foot because you know this person doesn't like you. And there's just subtle things that this person does the way she looks at you or don't put that there. <sighs> and what you find <laughs> is that you drop the plate of cookies, right? So it's like what's being projected <laughs> on you is that you're incompetent. And then you actually become kind of tied up and gummed up and you're doing things like dropping the cookies. Has that ever happened to you? It's happened to me. Um, so that's projective identification too, right? Where, where you, you know how the other person is perceiving you and you, you're thinking, I'm not incompetent, but somehow there's a subtle field that gets created. And sometimes when I'm talking mm -hmm. to Analyzans about this, I'll be like, you know, it's very much like a spell gets cast. It's like the other person has a magic wand and turns you yeah. into something that you're actually not. Like you're not a butterfinger. Like you don't just routinely drop plates of cookies. But something about the emotional field um, it's, it's like a spell has been cast and mm -hmm. suddenly you're dropping the cookies. And so what are this is very about? subtle and often if we're caught in it, it's kind of slipped in without our noticing it. And then we're suddenly find ourselves dropping mm -hmm. the cookie and we're like, why did that happen? So I'll give a clinical example. Many years ago, I had a, a brilliant scientist brilliant scientist in analysis who um, had a, a lot of childhood trauma and, and an awful lot of struggle. And it created this sense of inferiority inside of him, although by all accounts, I mean, you would think this person was wildly successful. And about a couple of months into the analysis, um, this person decided that they had to teach me about quantum physics. Like, <laughs> literally wanted to give me, uh, like, get out a pen and paper and, and you know, started, like, showing little YouTube videos and uh, trying, to, you know, to explain quantum physics, which, of course, I know nothing about quantum physics and don't have much capacity for that. And what they were trying to do, now, I was able, it was kind of heavy-handed, so I kind of saw what was happening. But he, this person was trying so hard to make me feel stupid and make me feel inferior, not only just uh. so that he could feel good about himself, but that the sense of inferiority is going to be slipped across into the analyst because mm -hmm. they don't know anything about quantum physics. So th these kinds of things can happen. At first, it took me a little bit of time to try to figure out um, why does why does this person think I need to know this, and maybe there's some yeah. symbolic um, level to what's being said here, which I still think is rather interesting on a certain level. Mm -hmm. But um, orchestrating this theater almost with the hope that something mm -hmm. will be slipped under the table. I have a couple of little scripts that we could have fun playing out so that people might have a sense of uh, what this looks like relationally. Um, and there's two <laughs> values in this. As we're doing these, some of you who are listening may realize, oh, I do that to people. Yes. Um, and, and I never saw that I did. And mm -hmm. if that happens, thank goodness, that's just gold. That's just striking gold. Because we don't know that we're doing these things and we're mystified by the negative reactions that people have. And the first step is to really get a hold of what we're projecting. For those of you that are receiving these, maybe you'll be able to see how you're being provoked. 
and be able to understand it differently and be somewhat more resilient and bring it to the forefront. Yeah. Yeah. So, so I just want to say before it, we go to the scripts. All... Before we go to the scripts, I just want to say, Joseph, you just said how we're being provoked. I also just want to introduce the word seduced because all of these are little seductions oh, as yes. well. Yeah. Right. Absolutely. And they are, they are part of the warp and weft of human interaction. This is not something that only, you know, people in extremis in some way, uh, you know, do or experience. Um, this is stuff of human interaction. So let's start with uh, scenario number one. Um, okay. Who would like to take the role of Alice? Oh, I'll go for it. Um, All right. So I'm Alice, and I say, you obviously don't care about anyone but yourself. That's why you're alone. Well, that's not fair. I do care. And why would you say that? Because you're a heartless person. You're just pretending to care. I am not heartless. You're the one being unreasonable right now. Okay, we're off to the races. So, so Deb could be seen yes. to be projecting her feelings of insecurity onto me mm -hmm. and then accusing me of not caring, which may not have been anything that was on my mind at all. I'm just sitting there, you know, plucking away, making dinner. So what we can hear in Alice's comment is her own fears about her worthiness to receive any yeah. care or affection. Uh, you know, uh, right in this moment, I, I can experience what got projected. Um, there, the poignance of that uh, for, for both uh, Alice and Bob, of Alice's fear of not being, not being cared about, and Bob's feeling of, but, but I do care. And, um, you know, the, the sadness and the loneliness and the abandonment in that, and abandonment is a primal human fear. Human infants need so much attention and care and protection and empathy and all kinds of things. Um, that I wonder if that might be a hint uh, for people experiencing these dynamics is just check inside and see what else you feel. See if there's a disappointment or a sadness or a loneliness or a wishfulness in addition to, uh, you know, the protest or the anger or the lashing out. And the sad and, thing and is that you hold Alice's that feeling? technique, yes, could yeah. you hold that feeling? Alice's technique yeah. is not going to get her the care and affection that actually deep down she's hoping for. She's very unlikely going to get a hug or a back rub or a yeah, nice yeah. warm kiss and an affirmation if she comes to Bob and says, you know, you obviously right. don't care about anybody but yourself. And it's very hard for Bob to, <laughs> to be able to translate that into a bid for affection. Yes, exactly. Uh, you know, so the, the problem with something like that is that it winds up getting you exactly what you don't want. Uh, and wouldn't it be great? I mean, we, we can only strive for this if our fictive Bob could have said, oh, honey, you know, what's up? Are you feeling bad? Um, uh, talk to me. What's going on? Although I do want to say on Bob's behalf, is, um, you know, sometimes, <laughs> okay. sometimes if you do that, you know, Alice is going to go, you know, Alice wants to push the feeling into Bob. So if Bob come, comes at her, yeah, that's oh, true. Honey, <laughs> you know, that, that, that may just actually enrage Alice more. You know, one of the ways that I think I see this a lot in my practice, I'm sure you guys yeah. have seen this as well, is when, I, and it's often a woman, although sometimes it's a man, a woman says to a man, are you cheating on me? 
why are you staying an extra half an hour at the <laughs> office? You know, what, um, you know, who are you talking to? And, and it's like, the guy is not cheating. He doesn't have any intention to cheat. Uh, he's not, you know, at, but she does this so unrelentingly that eventually he starts to cheat. Because it's so, uh, it's it's so it's such torture to be accused all the time of being unfaithful, and it erodes trust, and and then there can be this perverse sort of oh she's going to accuse me of it all the time I might as well do it I mean I've seen this happen I'm sure I'm sure you guys have too. I think this is really common, and those kind of relational betrayals are so deep. If we go back to early childhood, though, um, this feeling of distrust that somebody is not yeah. going to be, you know, a, a, yeah. an abiding love and attachment object. And so I think this cheating or this um, neurotic fear of someone cheating is this fear that they're going to abandon, that I'm, I can't count on you. To, to be around, yeah, and the uh, the false accusations actually reproduce what's the likely childhood dynamic, which was the young infant needing to trust the caregiver and something interfering with the caregiver's mm -hmm. ability to provide yeah. that. Yeah, you know, um, this dynamic also leads into the the psychological. Uh, syndrome of repetition compulsion, that by inducing a reaction in the other, such as, you know, I just know you're cheating on me, that's why you're staying at the office late, and then the denial, and then the, hey, you know, as long as I'm being accused of this, I might as well go out and have a few drinks or have a little fling, it is fueled by the desire to both master an early dynamic, an internal dynamic, and the belief because of early relational templates and how, uh, how they get set in us, that things can't change. So we go back over and we have these patterns, interactive patterns, where uh, we're both trying to make it come out differently this time and ensuring that it will not come out any differently. So it's just sort of like the needle that gets stuck in an old vinyl record. of It just goes around and around. Uh, and uh, to no constructive purpose until or unless we can lift it into consciousness. You know, this is the thing is that it does show up in the office there. And this is how it was originally talked about, as you heard when I read Ogden's mm -hmm. description of it, is something that happened in within the therapy so that the, the analysand might try to push something into the analyst. And part of what we've learned to do, hopefully, is to have some consciousness about when a feeling comes up, like an urge to get really angry at a client. It's like, wait a minute. Is that coming from me? Is that being pushed into me? Can I be curious about that? And of course, if you can catch it, it can be tremendously helpful for the process, right? Because you're not just acting something out, but you can reflect on it. You may even share with the person, huh, when you said that to me, I noticed that it kind of made me feel this way. And that sort of seems similar to a pattern that happens other places in your life. And so it's a, it can be a chance to kind of walk some of this back and open it up and understand it a little bit with the eye towards changing it if it's been a consistent pattern. Mm -hmm. So I am curious, um, how do you guys introduce an awareness of this in, in an analytic session? And, and by extension, how might somebody introduce this topically to uh, a loved one who, who, mm -hmm. who is provocative over and over again in a similar way? Uh, you, you know, what comes up right away for me is what our teacher and colleague, uh, Jim Hollis, says. Uh, what it's about is not what it's about. 
uh, and to pick up on that uh, on a feeling and uh, just a momentary awareness of like, oh, hold it, wait a minute, what's going on here? Where did this come from? Uh, this seems kind of over the top, uh, out of proportion. You know, I was I was ten minutes late. There was a traffic snarl, and this person is really mad. Whoa! Of just that momentary, what's up here? Is it really because I was ten minutes late, or is there something else uh, that that is stirring so much feeling? So pay attention to feeling and um, step back a minute. Step back a sec. Get curious. Hmm. What's happening here? And I know in the consulting room, I think I'm thinking. I've been thinking about uh, several, a, a good number of clients that I had, especially in years past, of how they were trying, and I hope I got it. Uh, to get me to understand something. Uh, in, in the case of one young woman uh, who had not dressed appropriately for the day and the weather was, had turned cold and windy and rainy, you know, and I knew uh, I had this basement office with a storage closet. I, I knew that I had a woolen winter cape in that closet. I thought, oh, God, what do I do? Do I offer it? Do I not offer it? She's going to go out. She's, uh, you know, she's upset about the weather. What do I do? What do I do? Well, you know, I didn't have a lot of time to think about it in, in that moment. But it, it was a plea to understand uh, her distress, her, her neediness. And it wasn't about do I offer her the cape, which, by the way, I did. It was to understand uh, something deeper than that, uh, of I will have to go home alone in this wet, windy weather, and I'll be chilled to the bone. Uh, it's, so there was a way of understanding that deeper need that then sort of uh, superseded the question of, do you get a cape or not? And that's what I'm trying to point to is how do we get under some of the of the of the words? How do we get under the behavior and under uh, the feeling of and I was annoyed. How do we get under that and see what else is there? I mean, I think uh -huh. Joseph, it's a yeah. it's a good question. And and the answer, in some sense, in kind of a classic psychoanalytic sense, is well, you make an interpretation, right? Mm -hmm. So interpretation means this very specific thing, where you point out someone's kind of unconscious behavior, and every interpretation is an invitation to change. So you might say something like. Uh, you're you're getting upset with me right now, and uh, I'm noticing that I'm having an impulse to want to get upset back. And I wonder if it's mm. easier for you to invoke, uh, to induce, you know, an angry feeling in me than confront your own sense of powerlessness in this situation. Something like that. Mm -hmm. I also think that there is a level um, that gets projected into us which calls us to really process our own uh, feeling and find that level of empathy. Because where I started with this in this, the example I just gave was like, oh, God, you know, now I have to figure out what to do. Um, you know, I really can't let her go out. I know I have the darn cape and so on and so forth. But the level beneath that was to find my own real empathy. Uh, to find the positive feeling 
of there is a genuine need here, uh, a genuine distress. Um, I've had other examples with other clients where that's it's in the literature about how it is a demand for empathy, but it's not the stated demand. So it looks like it's about do I have something to offer uh, in the way of uh, garb or protection from the weather. But it's also a call to find a genuine empathic connection just in myself that can be part of the field rather than being induced or seduced or feeling manipulated. Really is a call uh, to a kind of self reflection that is, um, it's hard one. You know, Deb, I, I want to push into that a little bit more because I totally get what you're talking about, that y- you felt mm-hmm. uh, challenged to find that real empathy for this little waif in a way. And, yeah. you know, there's a way that she, what what she did may have been, I'm making this up, right? Because I don't know this person at all. Mm-hmm. But what happened there was she didn't take care of herself. That is correct. And then Mm -hmm. she wanted to make you responsible for her. And she did. You gave her a cape. Yes. So that's the enactment is I'm not going to take care of myself. And then I'm going to make you feel really, really bad. And you'll take care of me. And she's really suffering. Mm -hmm. And I I just want to change the language a bit. She's not really doing anything. But the unconscious is doing it. Okay. She's really not aware so, yeah. I, and I know we're so frustrated sometimes. We're like, oh, God, he or she is going to teach me quantum physics again. And of course, they are taking that action, you know, yes. like another hour. Of course. But, uh, <laughs> but really, <laughs> but, but the unconscious is driving them and affecting us. I mean, we're all yes. just, you know, this sitting on this hot plate and we're all dancing around trying to keep our feet from getting burned. But but so the solution is for me, hopefully, uh, not to be reacting of like, oh mm-hmm. God, you know, I uh, either have to kind of um, comply and accommodate and care and give her the cape, or hey, she's an adult and um, you know she didn't check the weather before she left uh, this morning. The the solution was my awareness that. When I provided the cape, I wasn't, I wasn't coming from either of those polarities. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, and it, you, you might have, was... might have, yeah, it might have been an opportunity to say to her, um, you know, I wonder if this is emblematic of ways in which it is difficult for you to care for yourself. And by the way, I have a cape. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that was, something we could talk about the following week. Mm-hmm. But the, 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 that's what I'm trying to point to is what is so hard it is how to step out of that paradigm of yeah. how do I react to this versus where am I in this? I've stepped out. Here's a problem that needs to be solved. And it's just a cape. I, I'm no right. longer in the enactment. Yeah, 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 yeah. You're 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 choosing well, I, choicefully and consciously. Yeah, yeah. And I'm not part of the emotion that emotional field anymore. It's mm-hmm. just. Uh, and then next time, uh, let's talk about what just happened. But I think one of the distinctions there, Deb, is that when we when we're questioning whether something is induced in us, one of the criteria is, is, is this odd? Or is this a familiar state? For instance, mm-hmm. Deb, I know you to be very caring and very generous. It's not unusual for you to have that impulse towards any number of people. Mm-hmm. So maybe there was a bid for something there. Mm-hmm. But I don't know that 
I would call it projective identification because it didn't seem disconnected yeah. uh, from, from who you are. I think with projective identification, if we have a sense of ourselves, that it seems weird that we're feeling that way at that yeah. moment. It's like, I, I was not yeah. feeling sleepy a second ago. As a matter of fact, I've yeah, had a yeah. pot of coffee. And yet, yeah. <laughs> this person yeah. is speaking, and I feel like I am biting yeah. the cheeks inside my mouth to, to stay <laughs> alert in the room. So I, yeah. I think something is being induced in me. How yes. interesting. Yeah, that's true. That's um, true. Uh, but, you know, in that uh, interaction, I had to reach for uh, that uh, kind of neutral ability uh, to provide the cape that was right in the closet. So my the first thing that got induced in me was was an urge to be withholding. So that's oh, interesting okay. because this is, Which is this not is like another you. yes. This is another element of that's projective identification, example. right? Mm -hmm. So here's what I make yes, up exactly. is that when she had a need as a child, what happened was her parents were an annoyed at her, maybe, and what she did yes. was she recreated that situation where she had a need and you were like, you know, annoyed or irritated, or you just were like, yeah, you know, go figure it out, you know? And, and so that's what got induced was, uh, was an irritation an irritation at her neediness. Right. And that was the work I had to do. Uh, because when people project things into us, there is some work that we have to do. Mm -hmm. Of like, what's going on in me? Why am I feeling yeah. this way? Uh, what do I want to do about it? Uh, versus that little scenario of of Alice and Bob, where it's just where you know both people start firing at will. So I want to make sure that we shift this into a Jungian frame for just a minute. I mean, I think all of the stuff that we're talking about okay. feels very kind of copacetic to a Jungian, but these are not strictly Jungian ideas. As we said, this originated with Melanie Klein. But I think, I think if you presented this to Jung, he would say, well, yes, of course. And he would call it, uh, he would call it participation mystique because, you know, you got to have a foreign word for it. You know, that's in, very, in that's very elegant. Greek or Latin or French or something. Or, or French. <laughs> <laughs> so, but participation mystique is this, um, this, uh, that word that comes from the field of anthropology. And it, it means this, this kind of um, mysterious realm where we're in a kind of unconscious identification with the other person. So right at the top of this episode, Deb, you were talking about how this is unconscious communication, which is something Jung was very familiar with and spoke quite a bit about. And so here we are. This is how it happens. So you're projecting something into me. I'm receiving it, and I'm um, reacting, like, like you reacting with irritation to this poor little waif without a coat. Um, you know, in a way that's not characteristic, <laughs> that comes from her, you know, it's like from her history, you know, that she's, maybe she's annoyed with herself too, you know, and it's a recreation of a childhood dynamic that maybe her caregivers were sometimes annoyed at her when she was needy. And you start acting it out and all of that is unconscious. It's, it's all, your reaction is unconscious. I mean, it wasn't in this case because you did your work, but uh, her, her doing it to you is unconscious. Your reaction is unconscious. And that's why after one of these um, uh, uh, kind of a, a projective identification argument, you might go, what was that? <laughs> like, what were we even fighting yes. about? Like, what just happened? <laughs> because it's just very, it seems totally bizarre. So, uh, but it, it does say, I mean, I will say one thing, Joseph, you had this great point about Projective identification can only happen when there's a relationship. Well, I would also say that there's a certain amount of intimacy that's required for this to work because we have to feel a sort of a sympathetic, uh, unconscious to unconscious mm. to connection to someone in order to be seduced in this way. So in some sense, it is a testament to a connection. 
when this happens, whether yeah. it happens in the consulting room or with a family member or a friend. So how about one more script? We'll go to scenario okay. number five. Okay. And uh, Lisa, why don't you play oh. Ivy? Okay. You think my work is a joke, don't you? That's why you never comment on it. I don't think it's a joke. I just didn't know what you were saying. Because you think it's pathetic. You can't even hide your disdain. Well, now that you mention it, your attitude makes it pretty hard to appreciate <laughs> what you do. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So when, when we're so, engaged in this, Joseph, I think you said at one point, it is like slipping someone a script. Here's what I want mm -hmm. you to say. I don't really, unconsciously, here's what I want you to say. And Cal Shedmick mm -hmm. uses that wonderful metaphor. Not only is the script, the script comes under the table from left hand to left hand. You know, so oh, okay. like uh, the unconscious is like, yeah, that looks like fun, you know. <laughs> and then uh, we're off to the races. We're off to the races, uh -huh. right. Yeah. So often one of the ways that um, we can also sense that somebody is trying to do protective identification is to lead with an accusation. Those accusations uh, are so <laughs> intense. Uh, right. That's great. And, no, and I didn't. <laughs> well, I don't want to... Uh, <laughs> It immediately calls up our urge to defend and to deny. And then the resistance to the accusation is used as proof that, in fact, <laughs> well, you must have fill in the blank, been yeah. texting your ex-girlfriend yeah. or absconding with the funds <sighs> or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. And uh, it makes us feel just nutty after a while, particularly because the other person is so convinced it's true. That's the thing yeah. is, the person who's doing the projective identification doesn't think of themselves as being manipulative. They think of themselves as telling the truth. And so there's such yeah. a conviction behind mm -hmm. the inappropriate accusation that it's rattling and it's even a little scary to have somebody mm -hmm. level that stuff with such a surety. So inadequacy is a very common thing that gets pushed into other people. I mean, really, really common. So people feel that uh, you're at work and uh, your boss, you know, is feeling inadequate about something and then steps out and starts doing a harsh review of your work and pointing out all the ways in which you're mm -hmm. not doing exactly to the letter, but is supposed to be done. So you get to blush and feel really scared about you know, being scrutinized like that. And the boss gets to march back over into the office and feel like, well, they've done their job. You know? So inadequacy then gets pushed. I think that's so common. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I really like what you said about how oftentimes this uh, dance starts with an accusation. That feels really helpful to me. Mm -hmm. Uh, and because that it's... one of the purposes of projective identification in the example that you just gave, Joseph, is that uh, it's, it's a use of power. You know, that the, the boss has hierarchical uh, supremacy and authority, and he can go over to his supervisee, project his own feelings of inadequacy or stress or tension into that employee. And uh, he has the power to do that. Uh, and he will leave feeling, perhaps, let's imagine, you know, justified and that he did a good job and he, he called that person out on uh, failure to execute well enough. Exactly. Uh, so, it, it, you know, it has, um, projective identification has uses for it's a demand for empathy. It's a defense. You know, we get accused and we say, no, I didn't. Um, and uh, 
it's also a power dynamic of I don't feel okay, and therefore, if I can make somebody else feel bad, I'll feel better. <laughs> so it gets slipped over there. Sometimes, yes, it does have to do with uh, power, although often it doesn't. Uh, I think, again, this reproduction of early childhood dynamics is sewn into the foundation of the nervous system. You know, just those mm -hmm. first few months of life, and now that we know a little bit about neuroplasticity and neurobiology, those early experiences are so profound in terms of the brain itself. So it also makes sense mm -hmm. that we would expect those early dynamics to echo out because we've kind of been configured by the early mm -hmm. experiences. Now, that's not yeah. to say it can't change, but it takes uh, quite a bit of determination and a bit of suffering. And the suffering mm -hmm. is... knowing who we are. If it was easy for us to be in full knowledge of who we are, it would all just be a delight, and we all would have gotten it handled by the time we were 18. There is something yeah. intrinsically challenging and somewhat painful about knowing who we are on increasingly deep levels. Mm-hmm. And this goes yeah. to Jung's idea of conscious suffering, to suffer ourselves instead of making other people suffer uh, ourselves, yeah, <laughs> inflicting the suffering of ourselves on other people. Yes, that's lovely. And it goes to shadow work. Yes. Of, this is my shadow. This is my shadow rather than I'm going to push it into you, uh, whoever that you might be. Uh, how do I claim my own uh, neediness or a sense of uh, inferiority or a hundred other things? And so we might say something like when we're engaging in projective identification, there's probably some way in which we're not taking responsibility for ourselves. Yes. And we're, we're asking someone else to do it for us. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if that's a good place to... <laughs> yes, unconsciously, again. And I wonder if that's a good place to switch to a dream. Today's dreamer is a 44-year-old male who works as a translator and as a poet, and he offers this title to his dream, Velvet Darkness and the Big Dog. Mm. I can already tell he's, he's a poet. And a writer. <laughs> it's a great title. <laughs> I'm walking in the streets of a small town I grew up near. It is a completely dark and moonless night. There are no street lights and no lights in the windows of the house. It is also very quiet. I can't hear any human life at all. I feel like something terrible may happen. I feel myself near the evangelical church my family attended when I was a child. I try to enter the side door which leads to the church basement. It's locked, and I can't get in. While fiddling with the handle, I begin to hear panting, and clicking toenails of a very large dog walking in the street close by. I can't see it because of the darkness, and I sense the dog getting closer to me. It starts to growl deeply. I'm very frightened, and I wake up. And he writes about the dream. I had this dream after having become interested in dreams again, mostly because of listening to your podcast. I kept a dream journal for many years, but had fallen out of the habit in the past five years or so. I've also begun devoting more time to my spiritual life, which I neglected for many years, 
and perhaps even rejected because of the negative associations of my childhood. The main feelings in the dream, he writes, early on in the dream, curiosity in the soft darkness. Later on, frustration at the locked door, and then fear of the big dog. And then he offers a few personal associations. The darkness I associate with a velvety mystery, not frightening, almost comforting. Regarding the dog, I am really more of a cat person, and I can be skittish Mm -hmm. around big dogs, though I usually have a good rapport with them once we warm up to each other. As for the church, it's complicated. My associations with the church of my childhood are very negative, fear, humiliation, and coercion. My childhood experiences caused me to reject religion quite violently as a teenager. However, throughout my adult life, I've been interested in and dabbling in a wide range of spiritual ideas and practices, though they have all been very far from evangelical Christianity, at least ostensibly. Mm. So this is one of those dreams where I had a sort of uh, download about what I thought it might be about. Mm-hmm. Um, so the big dog is a powerful archetypal symbol. And, and a lot of times on the podcast, we talk about, oh, animals, instinctual energy, you know, man's best friend, this kind of thing. We talked about dogs quite a bit in dreams. We could do a whole episode on dogs and dreams, by the way. But this is a uh. big dog that comes in the night. And one of the other things that's true about dogs is they guard the realm between the living and the dead. So uh, in Greek mythology, there's the dog, the three-headed dog Cerberus, who guards the border line, the border between uh, this world and the next. And in uh, uh, Egyptian mythology, there's the dog-headed god Anubis who also oversees uh, part of the transition from life to death. So, uh, you know, there's a sense that it, it carries this kind of archetypal charge of uh, mortality, I want to say. And, and there's a sense of kind of being hunted by, by something. Um, there's that wonderful poem, is it called The, the Hound of God? Um, I'll, have to, I'll have to look for it. But uh, yeah, yeah, you look like you might know what I'm talking about. But it, but it's a sense of uh, um, well, I do want to find that poem actually because here's what I suspect is the man is trying to get into the church. He says, "Oh, the velvety darkness is comforting; it's beautiful and everything." But he also says he has a feeling that something terrible may have happened. So that feeling of dread was missing from his report on feelings, but it was certainly in the dream text. And he goes to the church to see if he can find some comfort or solace there. You know, I mean, it's sort of like, why are you trying to get into the church basement? That would be an interesting question to ask him if he were here. But, but not knowing that, I assume, you know, kind of looking for safety, the church of his childhood does not offer that. He is being confronted with the archetypal reality of mortality I think he's being confronted with an invitation to engage in spirituality, knowing that he cannot revert to the religion of his childhood. So I'm going to go off and find, I think it's called The Hound of Hell, and, um, and I want to hear what you guys have to say. I'm, I'm always... Um... I generally have a positive spin uh, on things, so uh, I I tend to want to think of the growling dog as something that's helpful. And having been a dog owner on and off through most of my life, dogs growl for many different reasons. Mm-hmm. For all we know, the dog is actually at his side growling at something that is on the other side of the door in the evangelical church, that the dog is an ally, but he can't in the moment perceive that because he doesn't generally think 
of that being an ally. But if I was, when I was walking my dogs, they would stop in their tracks, and if there was something they were smelling or seeing that they thought was a threat to me, mm. they, were, they were down and ready uh, mm-hmm. to protect. So we could say, well, maybe the dog was growling at him. Maybe it was growling to protect him. Maybe it's also showing him that he needs to growl. He needs to know <laughs> something about how to growl, which if it's an aggressive growl, that's a way of warning other animals that I am in business. So it's a way of, of posturing. It's often to avoid an altercation, but mm-hmm. to display a capacity for aggression if need be. Mm-hmm. So it may be that as he is in the town, in the velvety darkness, and meandering into the basement of the church, it may be that the unconscious is saying, you can't walk back into your church complex until you learn how to growl, <laughs> until you learn how to hold your aggression and snarl a little bit in case something tries to hurt you. I have a, you know, a somewhat different but aligned um, mm-hmm. take on this stream. So I think we're all looking at the same thing from you know, sort of different angles, like if we were all in a circle. Um, yeah. I see from two o'clock and you see from 10 o'clock and somebody else sees it from six o'clock. Um, I think this is a really important dream. Yeah, I do too. For this dreamer. I think Very, so very, very important. Uh, so I, um, especially because the dreamer says that he's become interested in dreams again uh, and has been devoting more time to his spiritual life. Yep. And, and that um, this is about his relationship with the transpersonal. I agree. And, and uh, there he is. There are no street lights. It's all dark. He says in the dream, I feel like something terrible may have happened. And our dream ego does the only thing in the dream that he can think of to do, which is he's near the evangelical church, Mm -hmm. uh, which was a scary place for him. But it's the refuge he knows because this dream takes place in his childhood complex, which is the streets of the town near where he grew up as a child. And then we have this clicking toenails and and big dog. Dogs traverse the realm uh, between wild life, the wild life of the wolf, from which they presumably evolved or animals like that, uh, into you know the, the flip side of that, which is they became, quote, man's best friend, unquote. So your point about the dog, of we don't really know what the dog's growl means, is well taken. And your point, Lisa, about the dog as Cerberus, the three-headed dog that um, uh, became even more famous with the Harry Potter uh, stories. Uh, what is this thing? It has archetypal power. Uh, and he's caught, in a way, between a rock and a hard place. Does he, he can't take refuge in the old evangelical church, which seems to the dream ego like, like a logical place to go. Uh, and he doesn't want to stand outside in the street where this uh, monstrous dog might be lurking. So we don't have a conclusion yet here with this dream. Something big is in process, I think, in this dreamer's psyche about his relationship to the transpersonal and where are the positive, welcoming, beneficent aspects of the transpersonal for him. Yeah, I mean, it's a real confrontation. And uh, just Mm -hmm. building out my original thesis, I guess, a little bit, the name of that poem is The Hound of Heaven, not The Hound of Hell. I don't know what I was Ah. thinking. Uh, but it, it's a it's a really um, it's by Francis Thompson. It's from 1859, 
and it's um it's a long poem not even, I'm not going to read anywhere near the whole thing but it um it it's uh Joseph Campbell uses this poem in Hero with a Thousand Faces to talk about the refusal of the call but it, it but it's an it's ah. a it's an explicitly um religious poem and it starts out I fled him down the nights and down the days I fled him down the arches of the years. Ah. I fled him down the labyrinthine ways of my own mind and in the midst of tears. I hid from him and under running laughter and on and on and on. And then, you know, at the end, it's, it's this dog that is chasing him and chasing him and chasing him. Mm-hmm. And, and then at the end, he, he um, lets himself be caught, in essence, and it's uh, the the dog is is an image for uh, the transpersonal for God. Actually, it's I think it's a Catholic mm-hmm. poem, you know. So so you know I try to avoid my kind of date with the destiny of uh, claiming this religious life, but finally I couldn't resist it anymore. So um, mm-hmm. I, I wonder this this uh, dream made me think of that poem. You've been listening to This Jungian Life. From our website, thisjungianlife.com, you can follow us on Twitter, like us on Facebook, help us produce future episodes by funding us through Patreon, and submit your dreams for possible interpretation on another episode. We'd like to thank our listener who shared a dream for today's show and hope you'll let us know what topics you'd enjoy hearing more about. Until next time, keep living This Jungian Life.